how cool would it be to hear these songs played live with Bjorn? Like, holy crap. Ghost Cult Magazine welcomes in Jay from Gizmaki. How are you doing, Jay? I'm doing good, Keith. Nice to be here, man. I appreciate it. Great to have you. I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate being able to talk to anybody right now. Um, (laughs) So lonely. No, uh, (laughs) music has been my best friend and has been my friend through this whole ordeal. Like everybody else, I have a lot worse problems than not being able to go to a show or do interviews in person anymore. But um, yeah, it's great to see you. Thank you for putting out this new record, this comeback, this monkey record of Mega Khaled. Before we unpack that whole experience and working with uh, Bjorn and all these things that I want to ask about. Obviously, I hope you're well. We were just talking before we started about just working from home and Zoom and all these things. I hope your band is well, your family is well, you've made it through this thing, hopefully unscathed. Yeah, everything's good. Good to go. So, and it is Omega Collide. Oh, okay. Sorry. So there you go. I know. Hey, every I think everybody has thought it, that's what it was, but it, basically it's the first half of the word kaleidoscope. Yes. So, there you go. So now, now, now we're good with that one. Now that makes a lot more sense in, in <laughs> Gizmaki land. Yes. The whole, okay, Omega Collide. I'll get mm-hmm. that correct before it's all over. I bust on myself all the time. I'm from the Bronx. I say everything wrong. I, I pronounce all these wonderful, beautiful, cultural European names incorrectly. Uh, there's a guy on YouTube here who's now dropping like video comments onto my uh, videos, correcting me, which is awesome. Like, thank you, everybody. His life must be just a, a total bore. I don't know. I'm just excited to have a super fan. That's <laughs> helped me become a better interviewer. That's my goal in life. I've been doing this over 15 years. So I want to be the best I can be. And I don't want to say shit wrong, but also, you know, we didn't get a lot of culture in the Bronx. We're just kind it, of street, street guys. <laughs> it happens. It happens, man. I mean, you know, what are you going to do? No big deal. Exactly. So this brand new album is out. I am so stoked for you. You know, obviously you guys had some personal stuff go on. There was a big gap between, you know, the start of your career and now, but now you are back. If you don't mind, I'm sure you told this story before, but if you want to give us the cliff's notes of what happened in between leading up to this record, I'd love to hear it. Yeah. Well, um, you know, obviously we had no intentions of it taking this long. Uh, We joked about the whole Kickstarter thing. It, you know, that it was titled 2012's Album of the Year. It was a typo. We meant 2021, you know, a little dyslexia there. But no, um, so what kind of started the whole thing um, was towards the end of, of uh, the touring cycle for the imbuing. Well, not even towards the end, maybe in the, near the middle, middle end. Um, our drummer, Jimmy, uh, came down with a wrist injury um, in his left, left wrist. And it's called decor vein syndrome. I don't want to get into all the details, but basically what it is, is whenever he, he was hitting the snare drum or anything with doing his, using his left hand, uh, his wrist and his hand would go numb. It'd feel like electricity was going through it. So he had to get that worked on, get it fixed. Um, you know, we had uh, a few drummers kind of fill in, help us with some tours. Well, Chad, uh, Chad Hagedorn actually helped us. He did a bunch of tours with us. And then... You know, when the touring kind of ended, we started to kind of get together to work on the new record. Um, you know, a lot of it was was written in 2006, 2007. So it's not like this music was just written a few years ago and put out now. Like we've had a lot of this material even back then because we were hoping to put out the follow up to the imbuing in 2000, 2007, 2008, somewhere around there, you know. Um, and then that happened with Jimmy. Um, so we got back together in 2010 when his wrist got better, started recording everything. And then things just kind of, you know, kept piling up, you know, health issues. I don't want to get into that stuff with a couple guys in the band. Um, you know, I had a kid, now two kids. Mike, the other guitar player, has a kid now. And there was just a bunch of other things that kind of led to things kind of getting pushed back. And obviously we felt terrible. We wanted this album out, you know. So then it came time, like we needed the vocals finished. And that's where Bjorn kind of comes in. You know, I don't want to get into, into too much about what led to us needing Bjorn. But, um, you know, when it came for that to happen, uh, you know, we kind of, I just reached out to Bjorn, you know, because we kind of became friendly with those guys from Soil Work on uh, OzFest 2005. Great guys. Um, anytime we go to see Soil Work, you know, Bjorn and, and Dirk, the old drummer now with Megadeth, 
you know, anytime. Like, oh, it's, it's Marjorie, all this stuff. So we reached out to him, sent him a couple tracks, and literally what felt within minutes, Bjorn responded and was like, let's do it. I'm ready to, ready to rock. So um, obviously the proof is in the pudding. We think it's, you know, just, we think it's a kick-ass album. We really are. We're so happy with it. Uh, you know, the Gizmachi on steroids thing has been thrown around. I've heard that um, with Bjorn, obviously. So, uh, yeah, we're just excited. It's finally out and we apologize that it's taken so long. But if it had been put out sooner, it probably wouldn't be as good as it is. So, you know, there it is. Everything kind of takes the time it needs to take. It is a magical sounding record. It is wonderful. Bjorn killed it. You guys killed it. Uh, whenever you wrote these songs, I love this record. It is, you know, I always thought of the band as kind of hard to define, but generally progressive metal. Mm -hmm. And and that's, I think that's a title that suits you, your talents, your writing style. I love that you mentioned Ozfest because I've been thinking a lot about that Ozfest uh, 2005 really set the, the sort of foundation for the next like 20, 15 years of metal. Yeah. And uh, people don't remember, like Arch Enemy played at like nine in the morning sometimes, Trivium, In Flames, Soil Work, really getting huge in America on those couple of middle era records for them. Yep. And you, you know, you guys, and it was a huge bill, like a very stacked bill, Mudvayne, Shadows Fall, Zach Wild, Ozzy. Iron Maiden, Iron Maiden. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of the ones that, that people yeah. argue that that might have been the best Ozfest. You know, yeah, I go and, back and forth between 98, 2000 and 2005 in my mind. 98 was uh, great. I also went to 97, which was like Pantera, Typo Negative, Manson, Fear Factory, Machine Head, which is yeah. insane. Uh, but you guys really, uh, you know, acquitted yourselves well, I like to say, mm -hmm. uh, in that experience. And a lot, you know, obviously I was going to ask you was, you know, considering everything that's happened now, you guys came in on kind of a rush of attention because of Clown. Yes. And getting co-signed by Slipknot, basically. But is it almost better now that kind of things happen the way they happened and this was a lot more organic and you guys just kind of did this on your own now? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously it was great. The whole experience with, with Clown getting involved and everything um, was great. But, you know, I think around that time period, you know, a lot of people maybe took that as a, almost like a negative, you know, like wouldn't give us the time of day just because of the whole thing with the attachment and all that stuff, which I, I, I get it, whatever. But, you know, it's not like we, I mean, in my opinion, we don't sound anything like Slipknot. So there's that, but uh, yeah, it, it's, it, I guess from our own standpoint, you know, I, I pretty much produce the record. Obviously nothing happens in the band decision wise, unless everybody is in is, is cool with it, you know, but it, there's a lot of freedom that you get when you're, you know, putting out your own music, you don't have to worry about, you know, a label kind of coming in, going, you know, giving their opinions and, oh, this isn't, you know, uh, radio enough and all this stuff. Like we didn't have anything to worry about that. We literally put whatever we wanted to on this record. And there are a few parts where maybe we embellish a little bit, but you know what? Tough shit. <laughs> it's, our, it's our music. We don't have to answer to anybody except for ourselves. So uh, it definitely was a little more liberating, I guess, to not uh you know have the the eyes and the ears constantly from from elsewhere you know kind of peeking in right on uh, owing to both of those comments you know first of all it's your music and you do what you want with it and secondly there really are no, i know that people want to make rules for the music mm -hmm. industry and people want to make rules in order for songwriting and song craft but there really are no rules you can do whatever you want you can do any you don't have to follow little footprints on the ground you guys always were your own band even with the you know the previous uh situation at the start mm -hmm. of the career you guys always did your own thing i think that happened as as slipknot got more popular and became who they are now they were still kind of on the way to who they are now back then so like i think it was weird that they were co-signing bands and you know clown was put doing an imprint and his side projects and he was really the first you know, beside Corey, the first slipped out person with a side career as, as a manager, a creator, an artist, things. So, uh, and then I guess Joey, uh, who's not in the band anymore. But so, like, very interesting stuff. You're not tied to that forever. You can do whatever you want. This record is awesome. I like them both. I like both these records. I mm -hmm. think they stand on their own. This new record's amazing. If you like, you know, any kind of progressive or melodic metal, but it's also heavy. There's moments of lightness. There's moments of real heavy 
heaviness that I really love. Do you have a personal favorite song? I have a few of my own. Oh God. Yeah. I, um, the title track, the last song on the record, um, that one does it for me. It's very difficult. And I know anybody listening, that's a musician that, that writes their own music. Um, when you listen to your own music, it's very hard to pull yourself out of it and listen to it as a listener instead of being in it. You know what I mean? But for some reason, the title track, Omega Collide, I'm able to kind of pull myself out and just listen to it as a fan almost. And I know the thing that, you know, having Bjorn on it obviously helps because, you know, we're obviously fans of him. But that song, man, I, I get goosebumps from it. There's a couple parts that get to me. I know there's a, um, at the end of the heavy stuff before the outro clean kind of, you know, weird stuff, um, there's a rain stick that gets that that's in there and if you have headphones on you can kind of hear a little girl kind of laugh it's my daughter ellie i had her do the rain stick on it you know i was like all right, all right turn it over now you know and i was up here i had the mic set up and everything and at one point she kind of uh you know as she ended up ended doing it i was like okay good she kind of chuckled and, and laughed and when that part obviously gets me pretty good but uh that song man there's something about that song that really uh you know, that's easily my favorite song that we've ever, we've ever written. Amazing. And I love that, uh, you know, passing that torch a little bit. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. you, you never know what you inspire uh, when mm -hmm. you bring in your family or something like that. So that's awesome, man. So uh, what are you, what are your uh, go-to songs? Oh gosh. Uh, absolutely sky and inner visions in the middle. Uh, that's mm -hmm. those are like tracks that I keep returning to in my repeat listens. Um, mm -hmm. But again, this whole thing is, but like the word that I kept coming back to is like, it's majestic sounding. It's like very big, very grand, but not pretentious, which like a lot of progressive, I'm a progressive rock. I was a progressive yeah. rock little kid running around my house with a cape. And I ended up <laughs> playing in bands that weren't quite prog. They were more straight up, but I always had kind of a prog thing in my own performing and playing. And so, you know, progressive music, progressive metal, progressive rock could be very pretentious and, oh, yeah. and carried away and full of itself. Mm -hmm. And, um, but on the other hand, sometimes that is a benefit. And I think with you guys, you know, being capable and talented writers, I think you guys don't, there, there's no too far, I think, with this band, which is what I love. I love a band that's like, there's no, again, we can color outside the lines, inside the lines. It's never, there's no wrong. There's no wrong way. Yeah. And I know, you know, from my, from my standpoint, this, if you're a drummer, you have to love this album because Jimmy is just, God, he's, he's he's amazing on this album. And uh, I remember what, cause I, I tracked the drums. We did it in spin studio in New York city. And I remember just sitting there, you know, cause like I said, some of these songs, you know, we really didn't uh, cause he was having the wrist issues and stuff. So some of the parts he was still working out before, you know, right before we got into the studio. So we didn't hear a lot of the things that he was planning on doing for some of these songs. And I just remember sitting there a couple of times in the studio. I was like, just started laughing because in you know, I'd be like, what are you laughing at? I'm like, dude, did you, you hear what you just played? Like that, holy crap, you know? But um, I'm probably Jimmy's biggest fan. I mean, he, he, he's definitely, in my opinion, like the shining light of, of the band. I mean, without him, I don't think we'd be as, you know, unique or whatever word you want to put. Um, I think his drumming makes this band sound how we sound, you know? Definitely the progressive aspect you know, with, with his stuff. I agree. Was it weird for you guys kind of coming up from upstate New York? I know people think of up the upstate New York scene as mostly hardcore and like mm -hmm. very like, uh, uh, you know, Orange County, Buffalo, Utica, Syracuse, like the punchy, punchy hardcore stuff. And then New York City at the time you guys were kind of forming was very like heavy metal, death metal, hardcore, NYDM, which is great. New York's a melting pot. The New York state is a melting pot yeah. of heavy music. But look, what was it like for you guys doing gigs? You get a lot of weird looks. Did you get a lot of strange reactions when you did your thing in front of people? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, everybody was always cool. I mean, the hardcore thing was definitely, you know, Orange County, you know, the Chance Theater and Poughkeepsie and all that stuff. That was basically where we, where we cut our teeth. Uh, we played there a lot. But it was always, you know, get on those bills with like four or five other bands and, you know, a couple hardcore bands and some other stuff. So it was always cool. I mean, I, I like that type of thing. You know, um, I like being on on bills where there's, you know, some different stuff on there. You know, that way you get different people in the crowd, maybe 
somebody that wouldn't normally listen to you guys and they're like, oh, these guys are actually pretty cool, you know? So I, I like that kind of thing. But yeah, um, and obviously, you know, things were kind of changing. I'm trying to remember exactly like, you know, because we didn't really start out playing, you know, nobody really does. I mean, nobody starts a band and then 15 years later is playing the same type of thing. I mean, especially when, you know, you start playing when you're so young, you know, 15 years old, I started playing guitar, did our first demo when I was like 17. I mean, if you listen to that and then listen to us now, it's like, this, this is not the same band. <laughs> There's no way, you know, but everybody goes through the evolution or whatever you want to call it of, of what they like. And obviously, you know, the influences that you have, um, you know, it's funny. I listened to uh, none from Meshuggah about a month ago, popped it in and I hadn't heard in a while, the EP, you know, and you could tell when I was listening to it, I was like, wow, you could tell that we take a lot of inspiration from that era of Meshuggah, like the Destroy, Race, Improve. And obviously we're not, we're not as near, uh, well, talented, but not as near over the top with the polyrhythms. We kind of dabble in it, but it's not like our main thing. You mentioned before the melody thing, the melodic thing. Um, and I, I don't want to seem like I'm rambling now, but, you know, I think somebody asked me recently, what do you think you guys like do? Like if you had to pick one thing you guys do really well, what would it be? And I think the thing that we do well is we transition between like the polyrhythmic stuff to like a melodic chorus or something very well. Like it's, it doesn't sound forced, you know, it's not like, okay, we have to put a, a singing part here. Let's just shoehorn it in. You know, I feel, you know, a lot of it is very seamless and it's, you know, it, it's natural for us, but I feel like, um, you know, I don't obviously not going to name any bands, but some I'll hear sometimes, you know, a band it's like, you know, super heavy and all of a sudden there's like a singing chorus out, out of the out of left field and you're like wow i dig it but it's it sounds like it was just kind of wedged in just for the fact of doing it you know and i i feel like we kind of do that well you know yeah i agree you're not rambling i i live for these kind of things this is what i'm all about i want this process i love to hear that process <laughs> i i mean in a way i feel like i hear you know i hear in the, the new gojira and i hear gizmachi so like i hear those kind of things you know and uh, they're also masterful at doing like, yes. a, a, a unseemingly random, unrandom thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, something will, something will happen. You're like, whoa, whoa. Like all of a sudden, like it'll, it'll sound like it's, but Gojira is just magical with that stuff, man. Like they'll do something out of left field, but it may you like, once it happens, you're like, whoa, oh yeah, that makes, you know, it works. Right on. I also love that they brought back the jaw harp, which is like an instrument from like a hundred years ago mm -hmm. <laughs> into a mainstream metal <laughs> song. Just bow, 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 bow. Like if people you know, look up videos of jaw harps now and, uh, you know, uh, Snoopy from the Charlie Brown gang used to play yes. in the cartoons in the 60s. Did you ever try one of those? Yes, I have one actually, because I'm crazy. I um, couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. I try <laughs> Yeah, it's it's uh, hard to get the hold of between your mouth and teeth, and then just kind of did it, did it, like like a little baby, blah 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 blah. blah. Yeah, like I couldn't, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I'll stick uh, to guitar for real. Um, and I love seeing you here in your studio. And uh, of course, I couldn't talk to you without you know asking like, who is the greatest guitar player of all time, and why is it Edward Van Halen? Um, you know, uh, obviously you're a fan. It definitely, you know, you can hear the inventiveness and the influence of your stuff and your production and your playing and your writing. But uh, yeah, it's just, it seems such a, it's still not real to me that he's gone. Yeah, he's, he's the best. I mean, um, obviously, it's, you know, there's guys that can, you know, the technicality, you know, you got Vi, who's obviously my second favorite guitar player. But like, you know, when you have that argument of like, who's the greatest ever, it is Eddie Van Halen, because what he did for rock guitar, um, I mean, he just, it was like what Michael Jordan did to basketball type of thing. Like he... Yeah, all the guys before him were doing it, but he just all of a sudden it was like, you know, you you put back. I mean, think about it. Eruption, right? You listen to it now. It's like, yeah, it's awesome. It was 1978 that Van Halen one came out. Nobody was even nobody even thought of doing any. You couldn't comprehend that style of playing back then. And that alone, you know, the, the amount of, of players that he inspired. The amount of guitars, you know, like he, you know, what he did for the guitar itself 
it's 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 not even an argument. It shouldn't be an argument of who the greatest guitar player ever. It's Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, he definitely elevated everything to a, an art form level, even in the most minute detail for himself. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be like, you know, crap. And I think of, you know, obviously Hendrix and Dimebag. Of course. People, you know, people like that. But, uh, you know, Petrucci, people who like, you know, put the whole genre on their shoulders and do something incredible. Well, the, the, and I don't want to ramble about Eddie now, but I mean, I could do this all day. Um, the thing about Eddie, it's very rare that he like overplayed. He always like, even his guitar solos, like obviously they're great, but it's very rare that you find one where he like just does something just to do it. We talked about just doing something to do it. It, for the most part, like almost everything that he ever did fit the song and fit what the song was, was trying to do. And that's hard to do when you're, when you're that good of a guitar player. It's hard to just not want to just like, hey guys, I'm just going to go buck wild in this part and just, you know, play my ass off and not worry about, not think about the song. It's, it is difficult to do that, you know? So. And you want to make sure you serve the song. And I think he never, you know, I know people have this impression because of the generation of people that followed Eddie mm -hmm. and by the wheedly, wheedly, wee <laughs> kind yes. of thing, the, yes. the shred guitar, Yingwe Malmsteins and things like that, that maybe it's a little less soulful or a little less about the song and more about the thing the the technicality but uh you know there's you, show me a bad van halen song that he wrote even i don't love the sammy era but show me a bad van halen song and i don't think you can even the sharon record is brilliant music like if you love rock music yeah i just it's just the, the fit i mean I, like i yeah, said i don't I want to get crazy he, here it's just he was able yeah. to do the live he was able to do justice oh he was on fire in that 98 tour but yeah. This, yeah it was just bad timing yeah. Do, randomly do you have a favorite guitar behind you uh that, that is your go-to piece of you know instrument that you write or play on every day um well the one that was on 95 percent of the of uh omega collide is this one this is uh, a little cut it's it's a little bit customized um to 90 1991 i've been as universe and for some reason the universe didn't make it on this headstock. I didn't know if it was like a prototype or something. Um, but I mean, the neck on this thing, super thin. Uh, it's just, this is the, this is the guitar. Like, you know. <laughs> it's got that RG body with the awesome cutaway. Yeah, it, it's, right. it's, it's great. It, but I guess if I were to, if we were to play a show today, um, it would be like that one, that, that black and green one needs some work. It's, it, it needs some work. It's uh, it's not doing too good. This this would be the guitar that I would I would uh, play live right now. Now again, another customized uh, RG. This one's a customized RG, not a Universe, but uh, it it plays so so good. This one, it's got bare knuckle pickups in it. Um, but yeah, another great another great. I love Ibanez guitars. What's not so. to love? How's the action on that guy? I see the treble, so I have to ask. How do you like your action? I, I love low action. I don't know if you could really tell on this, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. try to get it as low as I really can. Um, you know, I don't like yeah. high. I don't. I don't want to work too much. I always marvel at guys who rock the high action, but like again, different strokes for different folks. I don't understand how. <laughs> you actually also helped me with my uh, segue to my final question, which is, you know, will we get to hear this material live? You guys have families now in different stages of your life than when you were starting out. Less, you know will we get a tour at some point Will we get to hear these things at least locally live at some point well you make a you know I'll, I'll get to that but you make a really good point as as far as like you know when that first album came out um so it was 2005 so i was 28 when it came out and that was all that mattered in my life was the band you know and same with the other guys you know we didn't have families everybody still lived at home um but now you know 15 or 16 years later things are a little different um you know we can't really uh hop in the back of a ford van you know um and uh, creep around the country playing at you know little bars and pubs and stuff like we used to and and think but the way it would happen is and obviously bjorn lives in sweden we haven't really you know, he, he has so many things going on, but the only, we, we talked about within the band, not, we haven't presented this to him yet. So I hope he doesn't hear this before we present it to him, but <laughs> the only way it would really be able to happen 
is if like we caught a um, like a festival, either European festival or U.S. festival and did that type of thing. Um, but as far as like, like I said, hopping in the, in the back of a van, um, I highly doubt that would happen. So if you're going to see Gizmachi, it's going to be on a festival. And we would love to do it like, you know, the, the main the idea when this album was was coming out, especially over the past couple of years, was this was probably going to be the end like Omega, the end, you know, the collide, kaleidoscope type of thing. Um, we were thinking this was going to be it. Just put the album out and ride off into the sunset. But there's been so much, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's been some, there's been a little bit of a buzz happening, you know? Okay. And if it continues, you know, I don't see why we, uh, we can't catch one of those festivals and, uh, you know, and kick some ass. I personally would love to see it. Fingers crossed, and all that good stuff. For you. I want to play. I want to play some of this. Some of this stuff live, man. I really do. It, it needs to be shared and heard, and I think it'll. Let, I think again, uh, the world needs so, some live performances from this band uh, once again. So I'm I'm down, and I'll help spread the word if it happens. I promise. And how how cool would it? How cool would it be to hear these songs played live with Bjorn? Like, holy crap! <laughs> He's awesome i'm a yep. fan uh jay man thank you so much for sharing your story with ghost called omega collide yes it's out now please everyone go get it there'll be links below in the description best of luck to you man thank you so much for hanging out with me today and i hope next time i see you, it's in person when you get to do this stuff in front of people awesome key thank you so much man i appreciate it